Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person, real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outre-Terre. It is not intended for children. This file was locked due to security concerns. It has now been released to our agents now that the emergency has passed. Listen and review for training. You never know when you will be called up, agents. Be prepared. <sighs> Eugene Weller. Let me start again. By the grace of God, I was up near control helping her notate surviving paranormal Pinkerton caches in Vermont. Ice and water had cracked some seals, ruining a lot of material. Control spent most of the job doing paperwork. I was there because I had a good back. We got the call from Sean, and, uh, I could hear gunfire in the background. All we got was, GET VIOLET! Before we returned fire at, uh, I don't know. We split up. Control made a judgment call I didn't like and went off alone. I was sent to Violet. Violet had also gotten a call, and she almost shot me when I knocked at the door. Sean had given her a gun. She <laughs> didn't know how to use it, but she certainly tried to use it on me. At least her heart's in the right place. She hadn't met me, but she'd seen my picture. That part wasn't as hard as I thought it'd be. She came willingly once I explained everything. <laughs> she even had a bug out bag prepared, even if she had too many books. We even got out before the police got there. She tried to call Sean all the way to the train station. For myself, I was armed to the teeth. I had the full panoply of knives Jack gave me, two forty-fives for my long rifle chambered in the same stuff I shot the Medusa with, a Mossberg shotgun and a holdout stuffed down my sock. I helped her reload her own weapon. Well, with her promise not to shoot anyone until I was dead. Control met us at a train station. The plan was... Well, I don't know. Uh, I'll leave it up to Redacted if it really matters, okay? The train was going to take us between... Uh, a and B, somewhere past the Appalachian Mountains. The train was a steam locomotive. Its normal job was to cart carny stuff around small towns in the U.S. It was red and covered in advertisements for things that were probably not made to OSHA specifications. Looked fun as hell, though. <laughs> Pity to run it through the night like this. It was a cheerful engine. The two carnies were... shifty. Both of them wore wife beaters with the types of boots and pants only seen at an industrial concert. They treated Violet warmly, so they couldn't have been all bad. I barely spoke to them. Most of it was talk between them, Violet, and Control. I was muscle in this mission. I took a look through the train. The thing doubled as a historical piece on off-seasons, and back to front, a very traditional caboose, a box car, two passenger cars, and the engine's coal car. I was told there wasn't time to detach everything. Control wanted us away ASAP. She slipped a bag of rolled hundreds into one of the carney's hands and then ran off after giving Violet a quick hug and a good word. We boarded the train and the remaining carney got to work. I know I don't sound as excited as I usually do. You'll see why. I'm very tired. I can't get warm. I I can't wait to get back to the South's humidity. A man can sweat there. Never thought I'd say that. I just want some sun. Yeah, back to it. Violet settled down in the train car nearest the engine. The box car held an ATV that would take us the rest of the way. I kind of looked forward to that part. Driving through dangerous and unknown terrain, following the stars deeper in. That was my kind of adventure, summer or winter. I stuck close to Violet, eventually sitting opposite her on a bench. This was a wide-open, one-haul luxury train car. I don't really know the names, sorry to all the Thomas the Tank Engine fans. There were pretty plush seats with different rows facing each other or facing front and back. There were too many windows to be comfortable, but if there was a sniper who could hit a moving train window in the middle of the night, while a light rain turned to snow, with the lights off, I think I'd be in trouble anyway. Yeah, throughout all of this, the lights were off or dim. Part of it was so that we wouldn't alert anyone that we were here. The other part was that it preserved our night vision. It was a full moon, perfect for werewolves, vampires. <laughs> well, anything from night's creepy crawly roster. 
I think I could fill a book on full moon empowered monsters just with what I remember, much less what some of the paranormal Pinkertons throughout the ages have killed. I don't know what it is. Full moon? New moon? Uh, something about the moon gives the Ultra Terra a jump start. It wasn't a werewolf. I wish it was. I was ready for werewolves. I figured if anything was going to happen, it'd be a common monster. Werewolf. Yeah. Vampire? Sure. Bigfoot? Dark horse, but I'd put money on it. See, all these monsters have a certain amount of reason to them. I don't know what you'd bribe Bigfoot with, but it's happened. The first sign of something being off was the train hitting a deer. Now that's not weird in and of itself. Trains hit things all the time. What was weird was that it was a whole herd of deer running the same way and without sign of pursuer. Deer don't run like that without reason. It wastes energy. A lot of energy. And grass and twigs aren't efficient energy sources. Well, three of them got hit by the little engine that's traumatized, and I got to my feet. Violet screamed as the blood spray reached the windows and roof. It was... a lot of blood. Didn't hurt visibility, but there were red droplets over everything. Red drops over the moon, too. I didn't take that for a good sign. I couldn't communicate with the engine. Control had taken my cell phone and anything that could be tracked by GPS. Of course, she knew that GPS was just baby mode of tracking for guys like us. But why make it easy? At that moment, the question on my mind was finding where the attack would come from. I had my rifle out. A shot from a train was not something I had trained for, but the more damage at longer range, the better. I was looking past Violet when she pointed and screamed. I jumped back, taking a three-point stance at the direction she pointed. The poor woman was beyond scared, her rosary tied so tight around her hand that her skin was discolored. She didn't faint, but with what I saw, I wouldn't have blamed her. A wild man, covered in fur, was running next to the train. He was gray-furred with patches of white skin underneath, like an animal with mange. Its arms and legs were long, longer than I was tall. The claws were as long as bowie knives. Its feet were large and very human. It ran through the snow barefoot. Its feet rose to its thin chest, which was nearly parallel to the ground. Its arms flailed around as if they clawed at the air itself to give it a little more speed. It would have been ridiculous, but for its face and eyes. Sean told me about the Uncanny Valley. I think Jack and Jim are just used to it because they didn't talk about it at all. But Sean told me that some things are too close to human and too far at the same time. You can use it to tell what's of the Ultra Terre. For people who aren't in the know, it's why some people hate monkeys on sight. The animals' faces and bodies are too close, too far. This thing's face was too close. It was human. It was too far. Its mouth was full of fangs, all discolored yellow, black, and red. Its nostrils were flat against its forehead, almost like a bat, almost like a gorilla's. Fur covered its skin, except for the mangy patches. Its eyes... I... They glowed orange like fire. They cackled and popped within its eyeballs, burning and consuming something deep within. I could not look away. It wanted to eat me. It was so hungry. Eugene! Eugene, shoot! Violet slapped me. I snapped out of it and fired my rifle. I did not dare look at its eyes again. Instead, I aimed for its body. My bullet hit its shoulder and the monster screamed wasn't pain, it was rage. I had no idea what they had sent after us. I threw down my rifle and ran to the shattered window. I raised my shotgun and fired. I missed. The thing lunged at me, thrusting its clawed hand into the shattered window and trying to scratch me. I fired again and caught its palm, throwing it against the glass. The thing screeched again. It did not bleed, it splintered. It tripped on something and fell back behind the train. What? Is that? Panic was clawing at my mind. Sure, there have been adventures since the Medusa. Hell, a homeless guy got a good scratch on my arm while I was investigating a werewolf sighting. There wasn't anything spooky about that. It was just a literal schizophrenic who ran around barking. The police took him. I didn't even do a full report. I didn't break a sweat even as he threatened me with a knife. I don't know. I don't know. They must have sent it to get me. Violet screamed. She broke into something like a prayer, rolling through the rosary, peppering the speech with Latin and... Gaelic? She had her gun out. Violet, I need you to stay calm and not shoot me. Stay calm. She started to breathe deep. This was hard on her, but she was taking it like a champ. 
she started to breathe normally. Try to figure this out. If I can't kill it with lead, I need you to think it out. You did archaeology, right? History? There should... There was a thump. The hoarse screeching was getting closer again. I picked up my rifle. Violet was nodding. She had her bag out and was tearing through the books, looking for something. I think... I think... I left her there and ran to the back of the train car. I didn't dare poke anything I wasn't willing to lose outside. The thump made me think of the roof, but it didn't keep thumping. I checked out one side, then the other. It was making a beeline for Violet. Its arms were flailing and pulling at the air towards her. She was fumbling and sobbing through her books, trying to find something. I went to a three-point stance and fired. This time, I scratched its scalp. A whole line of hair an inch wide, several inches long, was pulled off by the bullet, revealing the white flesh. It didn't react. I shot its back. This time, it fell. It was making too much noise for me to think it dead. The bullet had smacked into where its right half of the ribcage should be. It was looking at me as it fell. Violet gasped for breath. Oh, oh, that's better. I think it's after you now. I said nothing, but I could hear its hate on me. It was like a high-pitched scream naming everything it hated about me over and over. It was distressing. Jack and that Native American pile of bones had spent a full 12 hours shouting at me one day, and then for an hour once every other day until I graduated. It helped cut the edge off. No wonder Violet had been a mess. I checked her. She was breathing normally. She had tossed aside her books and found a leather one labeled The Indian Mythopoetic History. She started flipping through it. It had, uh, detailed pictures. Look, we got seconds. What's going on with the books? I reloaded what I could. Control hired me to do a little cataloging of the paranormal Pinkerton Library. Good money, but it gave me an excuse to be a bit closer to Sean. The college loved it after the Rue Castle incident. When he gave me a call, I grabbed what I could and threw it together. I figured I'd either get hit by a human, which the gun is for, or I'd be attacked by a monster. If I knew what the monster was, I might have a chance. I did not notice that psychic attack until it stopped. It was ramping up. The training Jack gave me kept it from making me panic. It was still affecting me. A part wanted to panic to mentally shut down. That thing kept screaming at me to die. Just a bearded madman screaming, I want you to die, one inch from my face with all the genuine meaning he could muster. If Violet had been holding up as good as she did against that or similar, <laughs> she was tougher than she realized. I slipped into a bit of my surfer dude persona. Let the devil care. I've got to kill that thing. I centered myself like Jim taught me. I had no magic, but like all humans, I could control my own mind. I could almost smell the ocean. Man, those freaking tourists running around and screaming are harshing my buzz. I've just spent the summer going to every surfer-friendly beach in the country. The best blondes in the world are surfers, if you can't find any cowgirls. But I'm good now. Some girl is off for her morning shift and I've got the ocean to myself, imagining the screeching death of seagulls to cut the edge off of it. I'm not the best surfer. Mostly I did that because it was an excuse to travel and hang out on beaches one summer. I did roll with the waves, or in this case, the movement of the train. I had gotten some good shots off, but now I needed the kill. It was coming up again. It was damn hungry. It hated me. It was so hungry it wanted to eat me inside out. I didn't hate it. I'm not that kind of guy. But I did want it dead more than anything. It appeared right when I was ready. I fired my rifle into its face just as its cheekbones appeared. Now, most people know the arteries in the neck, but they extend into the head, right? So cutting them is just the same as cutting your jugular. The thing did not seem to have blood, but if there was going to be any, it would be there. The bullet struck true and its head snapped back. This time, one of its hands slammed its claws into the side of the car. It recovered and swung itself over the side and onto the roof. Violet was hidden between the seats, flipping through her book. I was by the exit to the coal car and the engine. I shot it wherever I could see claws and flailing arms as it pulled itself against the roof. It moved fast. I could feel its eyes on me. It helped me aim. I am a paranormal Pinkerton. If I couldn't protect one of our own's girlfriend, I couldn't protect the next girl who needed my help. Do or die. The thing kept coming, even with the bullets throwing it off balance. I checked the route behind us. No cave tunnel in sight. What a pity. I threw the rifle down again and ran outside. I had a few tricks. Namely, a dragon breath round. We did not have much in the cache I raided. Water had ruined most of the ammo and explosives, but I found some that weren't wet. I put money in my life on this thing hating fire. 
I clambered up the coal car which was attached to the engine and got into as stable a firing stance as I could. Carney was nowhere to be seen. The creature was charging at me. Its eyes stared right into mine. Those orange and black globes did not blink. Its mouth was open wide and snarling. Its nostrils were wide and flat. If it caught me, I was dead, but it didn't get closer than ten feet before I found my footing and fired. The dragon breath round sprayed sparks and fire fast as thought and straight on target. The fur burned and it roared, clawing at its face. I laughed. Too easy. Yeah, too easy. The fire migrated from its remaining fur into its face and then into its eyes. The fire died down, its energy being smothered by the thing's malevolent spirit. The burns I put on it didn't slow it down for more than a few seconds. The body was just a vessel. The real hunger was in those eyes. The real hate was in those eyes. They were looking right at me. I could see the fire spiral into the black pupils forever. It leapt and backhanded me. I rolled over the coal and into the engineer's cabin. The firebox door was open and I cracked the back of my head open on it. The creature crawled over the coal, sliding into the cab with much more grace than when it had ran. I was up on my feet and firing. I had no idea whether I would blow up the train with my actions or not. I just acted. Even though I did little damage, the thing flinched. I dodged a paw swipe. It cut a pipe and high pressure water struck it. It screamed and staggered. I gritted my teeth as the same boiling droplets fell on bits of exposed skin. I pushed through the pain, drawing my 245s. Hey, I didn't take this job to stay pretty. I had a plan. It was the only plan with a ghost of a hope of working. It was going crazy over the boiling water. Heat must have still been in the right ballpark, and there was only one thing I could trust being hot enough. I stood in front of the furnace and fired my 245s into its head. The bullets drove it berserk. Even its psychic scream became incoherent. It lunged, I jumped, and into the furnace it went. It screamed and kicked, throwing me back, but I charged in with the coal shovel. I slammed its legs, pushed against it. I was so frantic, I didn't know what I was doing. I know I won. It was burning to death. In the last moment of our struggle, I was smashing the furnace door against its legs, forcing it shut. After the fifth slam, something changed in it. The body wasn't fighting anymore. I used the shovel to push the twitching feet in, and I made my mistake. I looked into its eyes, and something reached out to touch me. I was so hungry in that moment, I could have eaten anything. Any one. I was so cold and hungry, I couldn't look away. The furnace was hot, but the eyes burned hotter. Hands covered my eyes. Don't look at it! It'll take you! Violet shouted into my ear. It was a little late. Just a little. I saw a little too much. The feet were in. I burned myself, but I could feel the door, and I closed the furnace. Violet helped me back to the train car. The carny popped out of a smuggler's box under the coal. He gave us a good-natured wink and attended the engine. Jerk. I was shivering bad by the time the train came to a stop. I did not... I don't feel the urge to eat anyone, but everything is colder. Violet helped me as much as she could. She talked to me while I made the journey, kept me occupied with anything but my own thoughts. It was a Wendigo. There are different versions, but this one was a spirit that was called upon if a warrior hated his foe, but could not overcome them. It would grant him strength, but make him a monster. In death, the spirit would transfer out to those who looked into his foe, turning him into a man-eating beast as well. How long did I look at it? Not even a second. You were going pretty crazy and couldn't hear me warn you. The second you stopped moving, I covered your eyes. I've been praying the entire time. Can you feel me? I think she pressed her rosary into my back. I couldn't. I got us to the cabin and I've been isolating in one of the warmer rooms ever since. I hate moments where I connect to the monster. It was fun at first, a little. See how a mermaid keeps her cave or something, but this? That Medusa? They're monsters. All these things were sent to investigate as paranormal Pinkertons are always going to be monsters. Some can be smart, sure, but some monsters are just... Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio. A license under an attribution non-commercial, share-alike international license. This episode was written by Ben Wheeler and performed by Kyle Adams. Ben Wheeler edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Kid Dickerson performs our audio editing. Visit us on Facebook, 
read articles on superversivesf.com, or listen to us on unauthorized Acast, iTunes, or Spotify. Contact us through Twitter at at Pinkerton's Ghost, email us at Pinkerton's Ghosts at gmail.com, or send us noble messenger possums with messages strapped to their backs. Don't worry, they know how to find us. Thank you for listening, and good luck.